Hey everybody, it's Mike from Get Your Rock Out, and I'm on a bit of a hammerfest come down, so the only way I can cure it is to see Overkill one more time. How are you doing? Again, Mike. Again. Yeah, Hammerfest was a hell of a lot of fun. That's a quite a unique um, festival situation with regard to uh, the indoor camping and uh, you know all the trailers and the indoor gig. We had a great time there. Whereabouts were you camps? Whereabouts was your accommodation like? Uh, when we we got one of those big trailers that uh, or actually we had three of them the bi three big trailers that are like little houses with living rooms and bedrooms and a you know sit down toilet the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah see we had that but I I felt a bit like Andre the Giant in mine I don't know whether yours were a bit more spacious than that they were pretty good they're pretty nice had a fireplace had a maid running around with a little white uh, dress on <laughs> Joking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always curious, when you do a festival like that in the middle of a tour, I mean, how is it different? How do you uh, get ready for that? How does it compare when you do a show afterwards? And like, uh, I don't want to say a smaller venue, sound control's great, but, you know, going from a festival right back into a tour mode in a way. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, it's the first time I've ever been asked that question, believe it or not. Um, I think for us, it's uh, the principle is always business as usual, regardless of whether it be uh, Hammerfest or Wacken, uh, or whether it be a gig like this in Manchester, or whether it be uh, two nights ago in Dublin, it's business as usual. And I think that if you keep that standard as uh, the top, you always get good results. And I, I mean, I think we got great results in Hammerfest. I think it was a really, really good show. But I, we take that the next day into Dublin and we take that into last night in Glasgow and tonight into Manchester. Cool. It was interesting how at first because you were very much, uh, you know, asking the audience to bring it on. Do you see it as like a competition between the audience and Overkill? Who can be heavier? Who can outdo the uh, one another? Well, I think I think there's only two winners then. <laughs> Overkill and the audience. I think that, you know, uh, 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 I've always looked at this as competition. It's almost athletic for us to some degree, or, or at least a parallel of uh, athleticism. Um, I also think that um, you know, the more you get, the more you give. Uh, so it becomes kind of a transference of energy. Um, and I like to badger him a little bit with, uh, with kind of a tongue-in-cheek sense of humor at the same time. And, you know, because I do believe it's a community, but I think that you can always bring something out of that community. But when I go in it, uh, and speaking of the stage, I go in it to win it. I don't go in to lose, you know. So uh, I have lost. <laughs> but, but most of the times I think I've won, and uh, I think probably uh, 30 years is a testimony to that. Well, what happens when you lose? What, what happens there? The audience is just too crazy, or what, what goes on? You know, I don't even know if that's uh, necessarily the case. I don't think it's necessarily the audience, but I mean, I think everybody has bad shows. And that's what I mean. I mean, you always want to compete at the highest level. You want to bring your best game. You want to have your A game, your game face on, your war face, the whole thing, but still have a good time with the people. Uh, I mean, you're for, quite obviously are preaching to the converted. These are metal fans that are here. You know, whether they're big overkill fans or not, that's not the point. It's metal fans. It's about that community. But if you go in and you lose... You, uh, you, you don't feel so great afterwards, you know, so that's it. And you try to make the next day uh, not repeat itself. So it's, uh, you know, learn from your mistakes this many years later. Now, uh, your new album, White Devil Armory, is going to be released in July, but it was meant to be out right now, I think. What happened there? Oh, just some personal family stuff. I mean, just, just that simple. I mean, nobody had any problems writing or, or anything like so. It's just, you know, I, 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 I just spoke of principles. Principles are, 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 you know, what we run this business in our lives by, you know, and, we, and what comes before uh, the band or the people in the band and uh, whatever their problems may be. And I, and I think that that's, uh, you know, probably a pretty good testimony to why we've never had to go home and, and, and take a relaxing little break, that we've been able to do this continuously from the beginning is that we put the people first that are in this band um, and we like tour with these people and you know I mean they're, they're, it's a good lineup it's a gelled lineup so the idea is, is that one of the guys has uh, an issue we gotta we gotta step back and say hey you first man whatever you need so well I was gonna say I mean you have gone through so much in your time you know pneumonia cancer having a stroke on stage are you indestructible no I don't think so I think it's it's it's, it's one of those nine lives things but I've used eight <laughs> Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I think that, um, you know, it's a great lesson teacher. And, and in each one of those instances, um, you know, if I had to look at what was the worst one, it was probably uh, the pneumonia, which was the most recent one, because that, that shit can kill you like, like this. And it, it had uh, it flared up to a point where, I, you know, I needed to be hospitalized. And I was laying in a snow pile in Buffalo, New York, with, you know, green slime coming out of <laughs> every orifice from the neck above. But the... Um, you know, I, I think that it's not about being 
indestructible. It's about adjusting afterwards. And you know, and, and I've I've always tried to live my life as a guy who's uh, who's gotten a lucky break just by having overkill or being part of overkill. Um, and you know, if you learn kind of from the mistakes, it, it makes a big difference. And you want you want to hear the funniest thing about that that whole pneumonia thing is I had recently stopped smoking. Right. So you and you you say to yourself, how, how the hell could this have happened then if I had actually stopped smoking? But it turns out uh, people who uh, do stop smoking become susceptible to lung infections right afterwards. You're going from, you know, 30 years of this to nothing in you know one minute. You have just stopped. And so it was just uh, uh, a guy told me it was it's better to actually step it down if you don't want to catch pneumonia. Yeah. But I'm I'm cool right now. I mean I got you know I got the pneumonia shot this year, so it's uh, so it's not a big deal. And I've learned from my mistake. Let's say. Well, I mean, it's interesting because I mean Lemmy's had to cancel a tour recently. It seems to be finally catching up with him. Yeah, at the sure, way. sure. You know, and and you know Lemmy's lived the the rock and roll lifestyle probably to times ten than I have. You know, I mean I I like beer here and there, and and uh, you know so I have said it in interviews before. My wife calls it the middle aged boys club. You know, we're out there <laughs> rolling dice, and somebody's lighting a Cuban cigar, and some cognac comes out. And, and that's kind of fun for us. Uh, just like I said earlier, we like the guys. The guys are what it's about. If the guys aren't happy, you can't present a great band. That's our, you know, that's our feeling here. Um, but I think that when it comes to the rock and roll lifestyle, we really only live it when we're when we're out on the road. We don't necessarily live it 24/7 uh, when we're at home. We we kind of look at this as something we have to cut into pieces and present it better every time. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, camaraderie there. I'm just out of curiosity. You said recently in a Metal Hammer interview that you never really got close to Anthrax, even though you guys are the biggest um, East Coast New York thrash bands. What happened there? No, I, I mean, and I don't mean that uh, negatively. It wasn't that I didn't get close to them because I didn't like them. It's just that you know, we were kind of Staten Island and New Jersey based, and these guys were out of Queens, New York. And of course we know them, and we like them very much. It's not anything like such. I'm not going to give you... Uh, I had recently read something that Joey Belladonna had uh, put into uh, uh, print, uh, and it's not that at all. We just physically never spent a lot of time together. We knew them through the Megaforce days, and we were friendly with them, but it wasn't... You know, hey, come down to our studio and let's go jam. It never happened. You know, so uh, I think it happened a few times with Metallica. It happened when uh, the Sam Hain guys were around. You know, things like that and other bands. But the Anthrax guys, we never, we never did that with. Do you think Overkill might have been a little bit different had you been from the Bay Area, like uh, just about every other band at the time, or do you think you would have stayed the same? No, I think we probably would have sounded like a Bay Area band. I mean, I, I, I think for sure. I think that that was. Uh, that was a local stamp that was on them. You know, that uh, the thing that was liked about it was a Bay Area sound. And, you know, the, to some degree, and, and, and not to be facetious here, it's repetitive. They, they carry their own moniker. Uh, they're identifiable through the years, you know. Um, uh, before the guy opens his mouth, you say Bay Area band. You know, I mean, and that's just the way it is. And a great thing, and I thought, you know, one of the great things about that uh, scene was that they, you know, they thought locally but acted globally. You know, that's really what ended up happening, you know, and uh, obviously starting with Metallica or somebody could argue the point and say it was Exodus or, you know, maybe even some of the more unknown bands, uh, you know, at that particular time. But I think that they, you know, they discovered a great thing and they, unto themselves as, uh, let's say, a, a group, where Overkill was always much more meat and potatoes, you know, I mean, we weren't, we didn't have all the frills and the uh, spills. We were, we were more of a... <clears throat> you know, in our, my, our opinion, more of a pounding type band. And you also said recently that you love Evile, you love them being a British thrash band, because back in the day, it, it's kind of weird, because Britain invented metal, and then America invented thrash, and kind of took that globally. We had a few thrash bands, and you've got a couple of uh, British thrash acts on tour with you now. I mean, what's your opinion of the British scene in general, today and back then? Well, it's obviously changed. I mean, we, you know, if you guys were the new wave of British heavy metal, we stole the whole next scene, you know? Us and the Germans, anyway, right? I mean, that's, and that's really as simple as it gets. Um, I think that, it obviously, it, it's not, uh, it, it's no longer um, to country or, um, or, or to nationality. It is more so a global experience. I don't really think that thrash is about where you come from anymore, with which uh, what has to do with your sound, whether it be Evile from here, whether it be you know an American thrash, or whether it be a Gamma Bomb uh, from Ireland, or whether it be uh, you know Suicidal Angels from Greece, or, or 
or havoc. Um, I, I don't think it's where you're from anymore. I think the sound uh, is branded globally now. I don't think you could say, oh, that's definitely an English thrash band. <laughs> you know, I don't think you hear that. I think you hear it's thrash band. Yeah. And um, so obviously the, the global scene is healthy and England's become part of that with regard to, uh, let's say, playing catch up um, after we stole the thrash scene from you guys. <laughs> from punk and new album, so you're all right. Um, I wonder if it, I mean, is it possible at all to sum up, you know, the time that you've been in Overkill, nearly over 30 years now, I mean, with all the stuff that you've gone through, uh, being one of the uh, the biggest thrash metal bands, arguably without, you know, uh, I don't want to use the term selling out or anything that some fans would do, but, you know, sticking pretty true to your principles, how would you sum up the whole experience? Well, you know, I, I think that there was always, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, there was a love for it. Um, and that love became a need. Um, that need became an addiction. Uh, that addiction was turned into something really positive. Uh, so, I, you know, if, if, we, if, if we have that first hit, you know, or it's like the dealer says the first one's free because I know you'll be back. I, I just kept coming back, <laughs> you know, looking for that high again. So I think it's been a really positive experience based on the fact that uh, something can move a person or people uh, to such a degree to actually have uh, put decades in your pocket as opposed to, let's say, just years. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, is this, is this any more, um, is this uh, uh, a career? I, I think it's a little bit more than a career. You know, you, you know the, the thing I've done the most in my life is be Bobby Blitz and Overkill. That's the thing I've done most. More than be a little kid, more than be a teenager, more than be a college student, uh, more than be a, a husband and my wife, the thing I've done the, the most is, is be the guy in Overkill. So I think it's actually become my life. So when you, when you look at it and say, hey, you know, I was bit by the bug back in the 80s uh, and still to this day have uh, that kind of a love for it, um, obviously because of the community support that's there, that it, it's actually a pretty positive experience over three decades. Well, uh, very unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this interview up soon. Happy St. Patrick's Day, by the way. What are you drinking tonight? I'm a plastic patty. I'm one of the, they, every time you come over here, they call you plastic patties. I was talking to Philip the other night from Gamma Bomb. He goes, you're a plastic patty. You're an old dog. <laughs> we accept you one day a year. And I keep telling him my grandparents are in the book on Ellis Island for the you know, immigration. So I said, that's got to count for something. At least we knew when to get the fuck out. <laughs> Uh, do you have a message into the camera for all our readers at Get Your Rock Out? Hey, let me tell you something. Get Your Rock Out. You're in the right place. Keep watching it here. Good to be in the UK. Good to be around the world. We'll see you. White Devil Armory coming your way in July. Thank you very much. Have a good show tonight, man. Right,